Hi, my name is Susan Elliott, and I am the NCAFP President and CEO of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. We want to welcome all of you today to our discussion on Kurdistan. And we are very, very pleased to have the Kurdistan Regional Government Representative to the United States of America, Bayan Abdul Rahman, to join us today for what I know is going to be a very fascinating uh, dialogue. For those of you who don't know uh, Representative Rahman, she has been in her current position in Washington since 2015. And before that, she was the Kurdistan Regional Government Special Representative or High Representative to the United Kingdom. She is also a member of the leadership of the Kurdistan Democratic Party. So we're very pleased to have her today. And um, we have agreed that she'll call me Susan and I'll call her Bayan. So it will make it a more intimate and interesting dialogue. So Bayan, welcome. And uh, I think I would like to start out with a little bit of, if you would um, um, indulge us, some of the history of uh, Kurdistan. And I think maybe some of our listeners may not be aware is how did the Kurdistan regional government form and um, and then what is the relationship between Kurdistan? We know you're part of Iraq, but between Kurdistan and um, the government in Baghdad. So welcome, Bayan. Thank you so much, Susan. It's a great pleasure to be with you and uh, uh, with your audience and members. Um, so Kurdistan region in Iraq, um, really the history of it, if you like, as a region uh, with a government goes back to 1992. And actually the United States played a very important role in the creation of the Kurdistan regional government. Uh, but before I, I focus on Iraq, Iraqi Kurdistan, um, of course, I know many of your members will know that there is Kurdistan uh, Kurdistan is spread over four countries. So there are Kurdish populations in Iran, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. I represent, and my mission in Washington, D.C., represents only Iraqi Kurdistan. So all of my comments will be just about Iraqi Kurdistan unless we specify otherwise. So Iraqi Kurdistan, unfortunately, has had a terrible history in Iraq. Um, many of you will know that Saddam Hussein was a brutal dictator and the Kurds were his biggest victims. There were repeated episodes of genocide against different Kurdish communities, uh, really starting way back in the 60s, but stepped up in the 70s and 80s. Four and a half thousand villages were destroyed by Saddam's regime, killing the agriculture sector, which was the backbone of Kurdistan's culture and, and uh, economy. And then, of course, there was the use of chemical weapons in the 1980s, famously in Halabja, where 5,000 people were killed, and uh, the Anfal genocide campaign, where hundreds of thousands disappeared. Um, but there were many, many other episodes. I don't want to mention all of them. Uh, so by the time 1990 came and Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, uh, Kurdistan was really brutalized, crushed. Uh, Saddam was using chemical weapons freely. Uh, he used them over 200 times against Kurdish communities. Uh, and of course, he had waged the Iran-Iraq war where one million people were killed on both sides. So Iraq and particularly Kurdistan were really devastate, devastated by the late 1980s, 1990, when he invaded Kuwait. That was, of course, his big mistake because then the US organized a coalition, liberated Kuwait, and uh, there was an uprising in Kurdistan, in Iraq, and of course in the South. Uh, Saddam crushed the uprisings uh, using his military. In Kurdistan, uh, one to two million people fled to the mountain border area of Iran and Turkey because we expected Saddam to use chemical weapons again. Uh, this is when the United States and other countries, the UK, France in particular, but really the United States, launched Operation Provide Comfort in 1991. 
And uh, there are many well-known generals today, uh, General Jim Jones, who was the national security advisor to President Obama, uh, General Jim Garner, uh, James, uh, Jay Garner, excuse me, and others, uh, Anthony Zinni, who were involved in Operation Provide Comfort. This really was a big turning point for Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, for the first time, the United States was providing protection for our people um, the, with Britain and, and France and other countries. And then a no-fly zone was established over Kurdistan region to protect the Kurds from Saddam. This was really the beginning of what we have today. And this is one of the many reasons why we're very grateful to the United States. We feel a very strong sense of friendship with the United States because this changed so many things. It saved lives, first of all, potentially one million lives, but it also enabled us for the first time to live without Saddam's boot on our necks. Uh, we weren't completely clear of Saddam. He still continued uh, to rule Iraq as we know until 2003, but he wasn't able to use chemical weapons. He couldn't destroy our villages. He couldn't, uh, kill and torture our people as he had done before. Now, the establishment of the no-fly zone over Kurdistan meant that for the first time, we could make decisions for ourselves. And the first decision we made was that we should have elections and that we should establish a parliament in Kurdistan. And so this is what happened. So in 1992, there were elections, the Kurdistan parliament was created, the Kurdistan regional government was created, uh, law number five of 1992, I believe I may be wrong, but one of the first laws that we passed uh, legitimized the Peshmerga as our legitimate force, our military. And of course, today the Peshmerga work shoulder to shoulder with American soldiers to push back on ISIS, Al Qaeda, and other extremists. So, really, Kurdistan region as an entity. Uh, formal entity recognized internationally. It goes back to 1992. And just one last thing on this, uh, Susan, if I may. I quite often compare Kurdistan to Scotland. Uh, we have a similar geographic size in, in Iraqi Kurdistan. We have a similar size population, about 5 million. And uh, of course, uh, the Scots have the highlands, we have the mountains. And uh, definitely there is a very strong-headed, stubborn uh, spirit of independence that both the Scots and the Kurds enjoy. And also Scotland has its own parliament and government and prime minister as, as we do as well. And we also have a president of the region. Well, thank you for that. That's a very good um, overview. And it really makes me as an American uh, feel proud that we were able to um, support uh, the Kurdish people and to um, to make sure and to help you to form, you know, your own region and your own government. But um, so what about today? Um, you know, we know that there's a new government in Baghdad that's led by Prime Minister um, Kahimi. And I was just wondering, um, you know, how are things going today? Uh, are things better than they were uh, a few years ago? Um, and you mentioned as a, kind of a second part of that, you know, in the relationship, because um, I've lived in the UK. So if you compare Kurdistan to Scotland, you know, would the Kurds like to be, I'm sure they'd like to have their own, um, their own country and not necessarily be part of Iraq. And how does that work? Do you think that um, that the the KRG is looking to move towards um, separating itself from Baghdad, and how how are the discussions? Are there discussions with Baghdad on that? So it's kind of a two part question. How are things going? And then you know what do you see perhaps as the future of the relationship between um, Kurdistan and I'll call it Baghdad, but you know Iraq. Uh, sure. So I'll start with the question of independence, because I think that will bring us to how our relationship is today with uh, Baghdad and with Prime Minister Kazami. So um, Kurdistan region, as I said, has had a terrible history as part of Iraq. Uh, very brutal, very dark. Our people have suffered enormously. We've been refugees 
most of us repeatedly, including myself. And uh, every member of my team in Washington has been displaced or been a refugee at least once. So it hasn't been a joy to be part of Iraq, unfortunately. Um, in 2003, when uh, the US uh, invaded Iraq, we saw it as a liberation. Um, as I said, we were slightly outside of Saddam's immediate grip, but he was still president of Iraq. Uh, he could still uh, carry out uh, assassinations. He was still brutalizing the rest of the country. And our fear was eventually uh, the United States, Europe would lose interest in Iraq and we would be left out on our own again to deal with Saddam Hussein. So we saw 2003 as a liberation. Of course, many things went wrong after that. Uh, I don't want to repeat all of that history, but from our point of view, Kurdistan's point of view, in 2003, there was a moment of optimism. We thought this is a chance to have a new Iraq, an Iraq where Kurds and Arabs are equal citizens. We're no longer second or third class uh, being denied jobs, being denied opportunities, being denied our most basic rights. We saw this as a new opportunity. For the first time, Iraq could be federal, could be democratic, pluralistic, and accept all ethnicities and uh, faiths. And we invested everything we had in the success of the new Iraq. We sent our best people to Baghdad, uh, the, the president uh, of uh, Kurdistan region, uh, President Mas'ud Barzani, um, worked hand in hand with the leader of the other main party in Iraqi Kurdistan, Jalal Talabani, who became the president of Iraq. So Iraq actually had a Kurdish president. So all of these things were huge changes, really optimistic moments for all of us. Also in 2005, a new constitution was agreed for Iraq. The constitution established that Iraq was democratic, it was federal, um, Kurdish was one of the two official languages. So all of these things were huge steps forward. And this guaranteed for us Kurds who just had this terrible history of genocide and oppression for decades, the constitution for us was our guarantee of our place in this new Iraq. Unfortunately, over the next decade or so, what we saw was a complete crushing of all of those hopes and that optimism. We saw successive governments in Baghdad uh, ignoring the constitution, either at best neglecting it, at worst going completely counter to what the constitution said, uh, to the point where, for example, the Sunni Arab community felt so marginalized, so alienated by their own government in Baghdad that some of them were welcoming ISIS. You have to be really pushed to a point of no return that you see ISIS or Al-Qaeda as a better option than the government that should be representing you. And we Kurds in Iraqi Kurdistan were also completely marginalized, disillusioned, with the direction that Baghdad was heading in. So 2014 was, of course, another turning point in Iraq when ISIS took over Mosul, Iraq's second largest city. I mean, it's, that's enormous. It was such a shock for all of us in Iraq, but also for the international community. And uh, we didn't really see the situation improve while we were fighting ISIS. Kurdistan region overnight had a 1,000 kilometer border with the Islamic State. We had 1,000 kilometers to protect. We were protecting Kirkuk's oil fields because Iraqi soldiers withdrew. And to make sure they didn't fall into the hands of ISIS, Peshmerga forces moved in. And we were protecting millions of Iraqis, not just the Kurdish community, but Yazidis, Christians, and Arabs as well, who were all fleeing to the Kurdistan region. While we're fighting ISIS, while we're protecting these communities, Baghdad cut off our budget. Kurdistan's share of the federal budget was not received during those years that we were fighting ISIS. Baghdad's argument was Kurdistan is going to 
export oil. And this was a way of trying to stop us. But Baghdad did this preemptively. We hadn't exported oil in February 2014 when Baghdad cut off our budget. We exported oil later because we had no money. Right. So it's an internal argument. Baghdad will have its view. We, of course, have our view. And I'm happy to answer questions about this if, if this comes up later. But I, I want to get on to the question of independence. So this was the history. We had optimism, greater optimism in 2005 when the constitution was written and uh, voted for in a referendum across Iraq. It was uh, carried as Iraq's new constitution with a real decline in our relationship with Baghdad and then ISIS. And while we're fighting ISIS and struggling, Baghdad is still playing games, not giving us our share of the budget. When the United States and the coalition were sending weapons to the Peshmerga because Baghdad had also denied our forces any of the weapons that were given to the other Iraqi forces. When the coalition was sending weapons, Baghdad was blocking the delivery of those weapons. So imagine how it was for us. Our soldiers were dying, were being injured by the thousands. Baghdad is delaying the delivery of weapons. We are taking care of nearly 2 million refugees from Syria and internally displaced Iraqis. Baghdad doesn't help with that. Baghdad cuts off our budget. So this is what we were enduring mm -hmm. after 2014. So guess what? In 2017, we had a referendum on independence in Iraqi Kurdistan because we had seen a decline in our relationship with Baghdad and then we had endured this extremely tense and difficult situation from 2014 onwards while we were fighting ISIS. So in 2017, there was a referendum in Kurdistan region, also in the disputed territories. These are areas that border the official border of Kurdistan region. We consider them to be part of Kurdistan historically, linguistically, culturally, uh, Baghdad sees them as a disputed territory, and that's how they're now recognized. But there are enough Kurds and other populations in that area that we were able to hold the referendum there. And also those of us who live abroad, we were also able to vote electronically in this referendum. The turnout was pretty high. It was uh, over 70%. I think it was 73%. And 93% voted yes to independence. So mm -hmm. unlike Scotland, which voted no, and Quebec, which has always had a borderline 50-51% vote, for us, it was a re resounding yes to independence. Um, so I'll come back later to independence if you have more questions. So what happened when we uh, voted for independence, and this will bring me to your other questions about Mr. Fakazami and the new cabinet. While we were getting ready for the referendum vote, the date of the referendum was announced in June, and the vote was actually carried out in September. So in that three or four month period, uh, there was an international campaign to stop the referendum, the United States being at the forefront of it. And uh, of course, Britain and other NATO, UN and coalition members joined the United States. From our perspective, this was a very serious disagreement with our friend and ally, the United States. Fortunately, we are still friends and I think our friendship and historic relationship was able to overcome this very, very serious uh, and angry moment in our relationship. But the United States was um, advising us to postpone the referendum. It wasn't the right time. The fight against ISIS wasn't finished. Um, our neighbors weren't ready for an independent Kurdistan and so on. From mm -hmm. our perspective, postpone it until when? Will you guarantee that in two years' time, if we decide to have a referendum, you will support it? The United States was not prepared to support that. Neither was anybody else. So we were being asked to postpone a referendum to an indefinite date without any guarantee of support for that referendum in the future. 
And there was no guarantee that the conduct that we were seeing from Baghdad would be changed either. So we decided to go ahead with a referendum. Uh, the uh, criticisms that there had been from the United States, I think, strengthened the view of our neighbors and some in Baghdad that the Kurds were on their own and that they could attack us. And that is actually what happened. Uh, the referendum took place in September 17. In October, a month later, um, we were attacked uh, by Iraqi militias, by the Iraqi uh, military. We were attacked by Iran and uh, Iran and Turkey started to implement uh, an economic blockade, as did Baghdad. Baghdad closed all of our airspace. Um, it tried to prevent our ministers and prime minister from traveling abroad, and it imposed an economic blockade on Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. So it was a very tense and difficult moment. And the worst part was uh, some of these militias were using American-made Abram tanks to attack the Kurds. And this is really where we were very disappointed and um, didn't expect that. We didn't expect that American weapons would be allowed to be used against us. And here I have to thank members of Congress. We're very, very fortunate that Kurdistan has bipartisan, widespread support in Congress. And we never take it for granted. It's to be cherished and nurtured. And, and uh, we, we are very grateful. And, and we know that Members of Congress are first and foremost uh, responsible for their own constituents, but those who have an interest in foreign affairs and international relations are very supportive of the Kurds, and we appreciate that. And many of them spoke out at that moment in 2017 when we were under diplomatic, economic, and military siege. And I think uh, this helped uh, the State Department, and not everybody in the State Department even shared the, the view at that moment, but it helped the situation to ease. And so uh, we got the message, our friends in the international community, nor our neighbors, none of them are ready for an independent Kurdistan. So we decided that we would once again do our best to work with Baghdad, as we had in 2003, 2005, we have decided once again, we will do our best to make Iraq a successful country, a federal and democratic country, a country where whether you're Kurd, Arab, Yazidi, Christian, Muslim, you are one and the same in terms of equality. Of course, I, there are other minorities as well that I haven't mentioned. We decided that we would do our best to make Baghdad successful and also to serve our people <clears throat> by focusing on um, guaranteeing a peace within Iraq. We didn't want to be under siege. We didn't want our people to be suffering any more than that. In 2018, um, so all of this was taking place in 2017. 2018, there were elections in Iraq. There was a new government. It was a new moment again. And, and we did our best, as I said, to forge a new re relationship with Baghdad. Um, the turnout in the 2018 elections was extremely low across Iraq and particularly in the South. And I remember at the time saying that this was a bad election for Iraq. It, it didn't signal um, a very healthy situation where in some parts of Iraq, only about 22% of the population turned out to vote. The overall uh, turnout was about 45% which is low, but in some parts it was half that. Wow. And then later during the uh, next couple of years and really towards the middle of 2019, we started to see very violent widespread protests in Southern Iraq against the Iraqi government, but really against the entire political system. Mm -hmm. uh, and these protests continued for a very long time the cabinet resigned in the fall of 2019, and there was a caretaker cabinet uh, which really couldn't take many decisions. Fast forward to where we are now, and I'm sorry this is a very long answer to your question, but I hope it's been useful. Definite great background for all of us. Please, go okay. ahead. Okay. 
<laughs> so the cabinet resigned in the fall and there was a caretaker cabinet uh, for several months, which was not great because uh, oil prices fell, COVID-19 came along and so on. And we really needed uh, a cabinet and a prime minister who was able to feel that this was a permanent position and could make decisions to cope with all of these very, very serious challenges that are facing us. And uh, there were three attempts to find a new prime minister. Third time lucky, uh, Mustafa Kaghani was uh, selected and the parliament confirmed him as the prime minister of Iraq. All of that happened in the past few weeks. Uh, we in the Kurdistan region have supported Prime Minister Kagame's candidacy. We voted for him and we have publicly said that we will support his cabinet. Um, Mustafa Kagame comes from an intelligence background. He was the chief of intelligence for Iraq until very recently. But before that, um, he was in opposition to Saddam Hussein. He uh, lived in Kurdistan at some point in the 80s. And he has a wide network of very good relationships within Iraq, in the neighborhood, and internationally, including the United States. So all of these things uh, make us optimistic that we are at a good moment right now. We want a good relationship with Baghdad. Prime Minister Kagame has uh, stated that he wants to deal with these long-standing issues that have caused tension between Erbil and Baghdad oil, the right to export and produce oil, what happens to those revenues, what happens to the disputed territories, when will our full budget be reinstated? These are issues that go back uh, a decade or more. And the prime minister has uh, expressed his willingness to try to resolve these problems. Um, also, the new cabinet includes uh, Kurdish uh, MPs uh, who are now ministers in the cabinet. The foreign minister of Iraq is Kurdish, Dr. Fuad Hussein. Many of you in, in uh, the United States know him. Um, we also have the minister of justice who is Kurdish and the minister of reconstruction who is a woman who is also Kurdish. So we are doing our best once again to be good Iraqi citizens, to make Iraq a successful country with good international relations. And we are investing everything that we can in supporting Prime Minister Kagame's success. Well, that sounds, I mean, it sounds opti optimistic. So I hope that we can be optimistic that this will be a change in the way that Iraq is, is governed. But, you know, there are, you mentioned just briefly your budget and the economic challenges that we're all facing, but I'm sure that Kurdistan and Iraq are facing in terms of not only the pandemic, but the drastic fall in oil prices. And how would you say that not only Kurdistan, but even Iraq as a whole are going to be able to deal with that? And is that particularly affected um, the Kurdish people more than say other groups in, in Iraq? You're, you're absolutely right, Susan. Uh, COVID-19 has uh, impacted us as it has everywhere else. Um, and then the fall in oil prices um, has had a very, very serious impact on Iraq's economy and even more so on Kurdistan's. So with COVID-19 um, in the Kurdistan region, we reacted very quickly uh, compared with Europe and the United States. Towards the end of February, schools were closed. About a week later, government offices and uh, businesses closed down. And the lockdown was very severe, um, you know, no crossing the border from one province to another. Um, uh, there were days where nobody could leave their home. Uh, they could walk to a shop if it was within a very close proximity, but there was no driving around. Um, so we were able to really control the spread of the virus by having a very medieval <laughs> kind of lockdown early on. By the time uh, we came to the end of Ramadan uh, and Eid, which was a few weeks ago, people were frankly fed up. Uh, businesses had been closed for a very long time. We were beginning to see economic hardship where more and more families, both in the host community and the refugee community, we still take care of one million 
displaced people in Kurdistan. More and more families were asking for food assistance. Um, so recently in the past couple of weeks, we eased up on the lockdown. Unfortunately, there's been a huge spike now in Kurdistan in the number of cases of COVID-19. The number of deaths is very low by international standards. About 55 people have died in the Kurdistan region. Uh, I think in Scotland, going back to the Scottish comparison, it's about one and a half thousand. Wow. So in terms of deaths, the numbers have been low, but we're very concerned that right now the number of uh, cases has spiked and our healthcare system is no way in a position to cope with that. Iraq, um, Iraq also had a lockdown. I don't think it was implemented as strictly as it was in Kurdistan. Um, I have friends and colleagues in Baghdad who say, everything's very normal. You go to the bazaar and everything is as it was before. Um, so I don't know that really there was such a strict implementation of the lockdown across Iraq. We're not really sure about the numbers uh, in Iraq, how accurate they are. I think it's easier for us in Kurdistan to keep on top of the numbers. It's a smaller population, five, over 5 million. And if you include the refugees, it's 6 million. It's much easier for us to control, uh, to, to keep on top of the numbers. But the economic impact is very, very severe for all of Iraq, for Kurdistan region. And then the crash in oil prices. Um, about four or six weeks ago, um, oil prices fell to $20 or below. And both Iraq and Kurdistan's economy are very, very reliant on oil exports. So the global oversupply, uh, the fall in oil prices, and then OPEC's cuts, and Iraq is a member of OPEC, all of that have had a huge impact on us. Now, for Kurdistan region, it's uh, even more severe because uh, we have been receiving part of our budget from Baghdad in the past couple of years. Uh, not all of our budget, but some, and that was at around $380 million per month, which was sent by Baghdad to Erbil. And uh, in April, uh, the then prime minister said that we would no longer be receiving those payments. And of course, this is a huge uh, blow to us, coupled with the fall in oil prices and the other economic challenges we have. We are now talking with the new cabinet uh, to see if we can resolve this issue. Uh, Prime Minister Kazami did retroactively pay the April budget share, which had been stopped. Uh, and we are now talking to the new Minister of Finance and the new cabinet to see if we can come to a short-term arrangement just to deal with the emergency situation we're in, and also a long-term agreement that will resolve these long-standing issues that we have to do with revenue sharing, budget shares, disputed territories, and so on. Well, it sounds like a, a large task. And um, I was encouraged, and I noticed earlier this month that um, US Secretary of State uh, Pompeo and his Italian counterpart called together a group of uh, countries to talk about a global coalition to defeat ISIS and to continue the pressure on ISIS. And it was very, um, I think I was encouraged that uh, the KRG had a seat at the table. And I do know that that will lead to, or probably may already have, some US-Iraq strategic dialogue, which I also think, having been a former diplomat, is extremely important that we have bilateral dialogue. And so um, did you were able to participate in that, um, in that uh, global coalition meeting to defeat ISIS. Um, but what about the, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, and then just briefly, are you going to be able to participate in this US-Iraq strategic dialogue? And, um, and, you know, how much of a role will you be able to play? And are you, are you optimistic that perhaps the U.S. will help not only Iraq, but Kurdistan with some assistance given these difficult economic times? 
Uh, well, thank you. I think these are all very important uh, questions and important issues for us. Um, ISIS remains a very, very serious threat for all of us in Iraq. Um, they have lost the caliphate, the territorial caliphate, and that is uh, certainly worth celebrating. Many people lost their lives in the process of uh, liberating all of that land and territory from ISIS. But as a, an ideology, ISIS continues to recruit people. Um, there are still thousands of ISIS fighters in Iraq and Syria. Um, Syria, there are very tough situations. There is the Al-Hol camp, uh, which is protected by uh, the Kurds in Syria, uh, that houses, I think, about 70,000 uh, ISIS families. Um, and, you know, what's happening in that camp? Who is taking care of the children? Mm. Are we just allowing another generation of terrorists to be brought up? And there are camps like that in Iraq, too where ISIS families have been put into camps. And uh, really, I, I think uh, the world has washed its hands off them. And this is a ticking time bomb because uh, those families are unrepentant. They still believe in the ISIS ideology and they're bringing up a generation of fighters or terrorists that will haunt us all later. So ISIS remains a very serious threat along the disputed territories that I've mentioned a couple of times, um, there is a kind of a no man's land where neither the Peshmerga, the Kurdish military, nor Iraqi forces are in control. And uh, this uh, disputed territory is, goes across northern Iraq. So Iraq's border with Syria, across northern Iraq to Iraq's border with Iran. And it's, so it's a very large seam, if you like, the seam between Kurdistan and the rest of Iraq. And it's in that territory where ISIS has a foothold. They carry out assassinations of local tribal leaders, for example, or police officers and so on. They burn the crops of local farmers if the farmers don't pay whatever they need to pay to them and so on. And they also carry out attacks against villages. Uh, they ambush the Peshmerga and Iraqi security forces. Um, what their activities are these days are more clandestine, more sleeper cells that are then triggered. Um, it's not like a frontline fight as we had in 2014 to 17, early 18. This is more clandestine operations, but they are a serious threat. So the fact that the global co coalition continues is really important. Uh, yes, the caliphate is finished, but ISIS is not. And we are now seeing ISIS spreading its ideology increasingly to Africa. And uh, a lot of the discussion of that global coalition small group uh, meeting that I participated in as part of the Iraq delegation focused on Africa, how in West Africa and Sahel, uh, you now have ISIS really um, raising its uh, capabilities and posing a, a challenge. So the coalition, um, as you said, uh, Susan, it's important that it continues. It's important that these meetings happen and, and you hear from the foreign ministers. This was a, a meeting of the small group. So that's about 32 countries out of the, I think, 82 strong coalition. So sometimes the meetings are of the entire coalition, other times it's a small group. And uh, so I think it's important that we keep our eye on ISIS in Iraq, in Syria, but also their global um, reach uh, isn't finished either. And then moving on to the strategic dialogue. Um, so the first uh, meeting of the strategic dialogue took place on June the 11th um, last week. It was a virtual meeting, of course, because these are the times we live in. And uh, as you noted, uh, a KRG official was uh, part of the Iraq delegation. And this is very important for us. Of course, we do have representatives in Baghdad. So the new foreign minister in Iraq is Kurdish, but he represents Iraq. He represents all of Iraq. 
he does not represent the KLG. So it's important for us that someone that is someone is at the table purely looking at things from a KLG point of view within the framework of Iraq. Um, so the meeting took place, and I think both sides were happy, number one, that it took place. I think it's important that it happens. Number two, that the dialogue uh, covered so many areas. Of course, security is a big part of the relationship, but both sides and the KRG, of course, as well, want to expand the relationship. It should be about our economic ties, cultural ties, um, about rebuilding Iraq and providing opportunities for American companies in Iraq. So it did cover a wide range of topics. And uh, we hope that the next meeting will take place in person, if possible. And uh, if it does happen in person, then I think it should take place in Washington because of uh, the way previous meetings have taken place. Um, one time they're in Baghdad, another time they're in Washington. So um, I think it was a good moment in the US-Iraq relationship. Um, there were some points of disagreement, but that's natural. And uh, overall, uh, it was good. And there was a joint statement that came out of the meeting afterwards. Well, that's great news for me because I'm really encouraged that there's a, a channel of communication between Washington and Baghdad and that the KRG is able to uh, sit at the table. I've got more questions, but we've got several questions from the audience. And so I'd like to maybe ask you some of the audience questions. And the first one um, is from one of our members, Benjamin Curley, and he says, you know, within the last 24 hours, Turkey has launched a cross-border offensive into Iraqi Kurdistan, you know, continuing a trend of increased aggressiveness from Turkey to Kurdistan. And he wondered if you could comment on this Turkish aggression. I think in the U.S., you know, we're, we're more familiar with the Turkish uh, invasion of northern Syria, but what is the, um, you know, what is the status of Turkish uh, aggression toward Kurdistan, and um, what uh, are your concerns about it? And is there anything that you think, not only the U.S., but what should the international response be? Well, thank you for that. Um, it's uh, it's extremely worrying for us and for our people that uh, Turkey is uh, shelling these areas. Uh, Turkey, I think, has announced that it had targeted what it called PKK locations. Um, you know, from our perspective, the conflict between the PKK and the Turkish state began in the 1970s. Turkey has used everything at its uh, disposal, and Turkey has the second largest military in NATO, by the way. So Turkey has used military force, it has used other means to wipe out the PKK, and it hasn't succeeded. So what's the answer? The answer is to recognize you, 20% of your population is Kurdish, and that population is growing, that percentage is growing. Recognize your people. Uh, until not long ago, even speaking Kurdish was a criminal act in Turkey. It's been decriminalized now. There are Kurdish TV channels and some schools that teach in Kurdish in Turkey. But really, Turkey, I think, needs to reach out the hand of friendship to its own people and resolve this issue within Turkey so that PKK do not come into Iraqi Kurdish territory. We don't want them there. We have asked the PKK to leave. And for us, the PKK is exporting a Turkish problem into our region. Of course, we are all Kurds, we are all brothers and sisters. I myself have many relatives, blood relatives, in Turkey, in Syria. My husband is an Iranian Kurd. So my family covers, has, has somebody in, in any one of those four parts of Kurdistan. We are brothers and sisters, but we don't want the PKK to bring their problem into Iraqi Kurdistan because we have no way of defending ourselves mm -hmm. against Turkey. When Turkey strikes, what can we do? And we do want the international community to uh, 
speak out about uh, Iraqi sovereignty. It seems to us that Iraqi sovereignty matters when we want independence, but it doesn't matter when others encroach on Iraqi sovereignty. So it is very worrying for our people. Um, we don't want the PKK in our area because we can't do anything to help them and no, nor can we do anything when Turkey attacks those people. And maybe some of those people were not PKK elements. What about those people? What about the Kurds who have now lost their livelihoods because their farms have been blown up? And there are hundreds of villages actually along the Kurdistan region border with Iran and Turkey that are no longer habitable because of Iranian and Turkish border shelling. So it's, it affects our people enormously, but what can we do about it? Uh, it's it's uh, really very, very sad. And if you follow the Kurdish media or social media, you'll see the heartache and the anger that there is among the Kurds uh, in all parts of Kurdistan. Well, I think it's really important to, to bring this to light, what you've just talked about. So I hope that you can engage with not only your U.S. counterparts, but others in Washington about you know, kind of the situation that you face, that you're faced with being attacked, just as you mentioned, um, because of a group that really you don't have anything to do with, at least not the, the things that that the, the, the terrorist acts that they've been in, involved in, or at least that the Turks think that they've been involved in. We have another question, which I think is kind of interesting, and it's from uh, Asif Ahmed. And uh, uh, Asif, if I pronounce your name wrong, please pardon me. But one of the things he had asked, he did ask about the PKK, but the second part of his question was, could you tell us a little bit about the relationship between the KRG and the Israeli government. I think that's something that maybe a lot of Americans don't realize that there is um, what I think is, is a very good or a strong relationship. So perhaps you could comment on that. Sure, so we, we don't have any official relationship with uh, Israel. Uh, by official, I mean there isn't an Israeli consulate in Kurdistan. Uh, we don't have a representative there. We don't have any official dealings with Israel. Um, and the reason for that is that foreign policy is the remit of Baghdad or the federal government uh, within the Iraqi constitution. Um, uh, foreign policy is led by the federal government. So if Baghdad doesn't have a relationship with uh, a certain government in an official capacity, we have to follow along those lines. So that's the situation. But in terms of empathy, in terms of individual person-to-person -person relations, uh, absolutely. Uh, we have no problem with the existence of Israel, but we also believe in the rights of the Palestinian people. And actually, there are Palestinian refugees in Kurdistan who've been with us for decades uh, and there is a Palestinian uh, envoy uh, or consul, I guess he would be, in the Kurdistan region. So um, we uh, also have, I think, around 250,000 Kurds in Israel who are Jewish Kurds. There used to be a very vibrant and large Jewish community across Iraq, not just in Kurdistan. Baghdad had a very strong and very successful Jewish community. Uh, of course, in Kurdistan too, but over the course of the 20th century, they were oppressed and really forced out of the country at the end of the day. That's really what happened to them, and including uh, Kurdish Jews as well. So today there are, I believe, about a quarter of a million Kurdish Jews in Israel, and they come and go. They still own land in Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, maybe they still have relatives in Iraqi Kurdistan and so on. So at an individual level, um, there is a relationship, but officially uh, we are not able to engage. Yeah. We have another question which um, is related to this, but it also is related to what you've discussed about how many 
displaced or how many Kurds there are in different countries of the Middle East. And this comes from one of our uh, trustees, uh, Richard Howe. And he said, you know, the fact that Kurdistan is not a separate country is largely no accident of history, which I know that you know, Bayan. But, you know, today the Kurds live in four different countries. Uh, they share a common language and kinship, as you mentioned. But, you know, the only realistic way that Kurdistan can exist today um, is um, to be um, a separate is as a separate region within Iraq. So we've established that. And, and yet the Kurds living in Syria are in a desperate need of assistance uh, from Iraqi Kurds because they are under attack from two directions, not only from, um, you know, from their own government in Syria, but then we know from Turkey. So is there any way that the KRG uh, can assist their, their Kurdish um, allies, or I won't call them allies, but the Kurdish brothers and sisters in Syria? Uh, we do help in terms of humanitarian assistance and uh, also uh, U.S. and coalition, a lot of their logistics and so on for Syria is done through uh, Iraqi Kurdistan and Iraq. So we assist in in those ways and uh, a lot of the humanitarian aid that goes into Syria has to go through Iraqi Kurdistan. We're not able to help in other ways that we would like to, uh, partly for our own economic reasons. Uh, right now we're struggling in Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, let alone to, to be able to assist somewhere else. There are a quarter of a million Syrian refugees in Iraqi Kurdistan, mostly Kurdish, but also some Arabs and Christians as well. So we have helped also uh, in 2015 when Kobani was under siege. And Kobani was really a key battleground. This was in early 2015, maybe it started late 14, early 2015. Kobani was under siege by ISIS and um, the Kurds in Kobani were fighting back with everything they had, which was not very much. Uh, and Kobani is, is close to the Turkish border, but Turkey did nothing to assist the Kurds there. Eventually, we and the United States were able to persuade Turkey to allow Iraqi Kurdish Peshmerga to go through Turkey into Syria to support our brethren in Kobani to defeat ISIS in that key battle that was taking place. So we have been able to assist, but Turkey unfortunately was not prepared to, to allow that mm -hmm. to happen again, where our Peshmerga would go across Turkish territory into Syria. Um, we are extremely concerned by what's happening in <laughs> Syria. In October, when Turkish forces moved into the border area of Syria, which is really a Kurdish area. It's mixed, but largely Kurdish area of Syria. It displaced a very large number of people. Um, and Turkey is backing proxies that are out of control. Many of them are no different from ISIS. Really, the, the conduct, the human rights abuses that they're engaged in, they assassinated a female Kurdish politician uh, in that area. We are hearing about women being kidnapped and raped. We are hearing about human rights abuses on a daily basis. So I think Turkey really needs to reconsider some of these proxies that it's supporting in that area. We're concerned about the security, about the humanitarian situation, and now with COVID-19 as well. We're very concerned about that. So how do we help our brethren in Syria? First, we're taking care of a quarter of a million refugees in Iraqi Kurdistan. Second, we do allow humanitarian assistance to cross our border into Syria to assist them. Some of the assistance actually comes from our own government and our own population. Mm -hmm. And we support the coalition in, in their work in Syria as well. And then, of course, we try to highlight to our friends in America uh, for example, in Congress and uh, the State Department and the DOD, our concerns about these proxies that I've just uh, described. And would you say that, that these proxies are 
what's the, I'm going to combine a few questions because I have several and I know we don't have much time, but would you say that Turkey and what Turkey's doing is the greatest threat to Kurdish interests? Or is there something else that perhaps we haven't discussed that, that we, you know, not only Americans, but the international community should know about? Do you mean Kurdish interests in Syria? A Kurdish interest, I would say, in, in general. I mean, because the question is, is, you know, what is the greatest threat to Kurdish interests? Um, and uh, the questioner didn't really say one or the other, but I guess one of the things that I've been thinking about is, you know, you mentioned independence and independence, you know, for um, uh, Iraqi Kurds, but would you envision that you would want a Kurdish state and bring Kurds who have had to um, be displaced, you know, to come together in one state in Iraq? Or would you envision that this would be a Kurdish state just for Iraqi Kurds? Well, the referendum that we had in 2017 was only for Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, so we were very clear about that. And, and in order to be able to vote, you had to have proof that you were from Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, I think the greatest threat to Kurdish interests, if I can be very general about it, yeah. is really racism and a supremacist mentality that I'm afraid dogs the Middle East. Um, you know, there are six, seven million Kurds in Iraq, uh, inside the Kurdistan region and in the disputed territories and so on. If you combine, maybe it's about six or seven million in Iraq. In Iran, 10 or 12 million Kurds. In Turkey, the numbers range from 15 million to 25 million. In Syria, between two and three million. This is a substantial population. This is a, if you put all of us together, it's a very big population in the Middle East. Our population combined would be bigger than Iraq's population as a whole. So you can't deny a growing population that's growing by the millions, you can't deny a population their rights forever. We can see in Iraq that Iraqi elections um, are often, no, let, let me rephrase that. In Iraq, whenever we have elections and we have government formation, the Kurds play a role. Our role uh, rises and declines as depending on the year and the politics but we are always a player in the elections we are always a factor in deciding who is prime minister in baghdad in turkey the kurdish vote decided who would be the mayor of istanbul it was the kurdish vote that decided who would be the mayor of istanbul and that was a a, a very big shock to the turkish establishment so you can't continue to deny a population forever. And I would say to our friends and our brothers and sisters, not the Kurds, the Iranians, the Turks, the Arabs in Iraq and Syria, please accept the Kurds as your equal. You can't deny us anymore. You can't deny our language, our heritage. Give us equal citizenship and your countries will be stronger for it. Your countries will enjoy democracy. Your countries will be part of the international community in a much healthier way than you are right now. Well, Bayan, we are about out of time, but I do have one question that um, is on the list and maybe we could end with this because I think it tells the story a little bit about you and you know why you have been so important to the Kurdish cause. And they ask about, you know, are you the daughter of, of the, um, the former um, deputy prime minister who was murdered in Erbil? I know the answer to the question to that, but maybe perhaps you could, um, um, you could tell us a little bit about your own personal story and we can end on what I think is how you have taken personal tragedy and not done something negative, but been a cause for good, for not only the good of the Kurdish people, but, you know, for the good of Iraq and the Middle East. Well, you're so kind, Susan. Thank you so much for saying those the things. Truth. I always speak the truth. Thank you. Well, I'm very proud of my father's history and his role in the Kurdish movement. 
Um, in fact, I, I should really go back to my grandfather. Um, my grandfather didn't really take a political post, but he financed the Kurdish movement when it was an underground movement uh, struggling against different governments in Iraq and, and most vehemently against Saddam Hussein's dictatorship. So my grandfather was a wealthy businessman, self-made, I should say, uh, but he spent his wealth on the Kurdish movement. He financed the Kurdish movement um, along with others. I don't mean alone, of course. And uh, he uh, championed uh, the Kurdish movement in Sinjar. And Sinjar is today very famous for the Yazidis. It's their homeland, but Sinjar historically has been mixed with Christians and Yazidis. Um, so my grandfather, I think, played an important role in the Kurdish struggle in uh, Iraq. And then my father, um, he uh, was from a very rural, quiet part of uh, Kurdistan, Sinjar, um, but he was very smart. He got a scholarship and went to university in the UK. He went to Manchester University, became a Manchester United fan. <laughs> and uh, he studied engineering. And uh, he went back to Iraq and worked in the oil ministry to begin with. Um, later, he joined uh, the Kurdish movement. He became a member of the Kurdistan Democratic Party, which I'm a member of today and very quickly rose uh, to the leadership of the Kurdistan Democratic Party and became a, a very important figure in the Kurdish struggle and uh, Kurdish rights. And in 1970, there was an autonomy agreement with the Iraqi government. My father was one of the people that negotiated that agreement with Baghdad. He later became a minister uh, in the cabinet. A part of the agreement was Kurds would be given cabinet posts in the Iraqi cabinet. So he became a minister in Baghdad and saw uh, Saddam Hussein uh, very close up. Saddam at that time was vice president. By the end of the 70s, he became president. But um, my father got to know Saddam Hussein and warned the Kurdish leadership that Saddam was ruthless and that one day he would become the leader of Iraq. And uh, so, I'm very proud of what my father achieved and what he did for our people. He sacrificed a great deal, as did my mother. Um, and unfortunately, in 2004, by then my father was deputy prime minister of the Kurdistan region. Um, in 2004, Islamist terrorists uh, attacked the headquarters of the two main Kurdish parties, the PUK and the KDP. And uh, it was a twin suicide attack, uh, took place at exactly at the same time in two different buildings, different parts of Erbil. And uh, they were aiming to hit at the leadership of those two parties. And uh, my father and my elder brother, Salah, were in uh, one of those buildings and they with uh, over a hundred people were killed uh, in the twin suicide attack and hundreds of others were injured. And uh, it was a, a real shock to the people of Kurdistan. This was in 2004. We hadn't really seen suicide bombings. We had seen car bombs, but there was no mindset ready for somebody to walk into a building and blow themselves up. So the security really wasn't in place because we didn't expect that. And uh, it was a blow to, uh, of course, my family, but uh, I would say also to the people of Kurdistan and the anniversary of that attack is marked every year uh, by um, the Kurdistan regional government and all of the diplomats in Kurdistan as well. Um, my personal involvement, really, I, I grew up in Britain, as I'm sure you can tell from my accent. Um, I grew up in Britain. I worked as a journalist. I worked at the Financial Times uh, for about eight years. But before that, I worked elsewhere in, in other newspapers in the UK. And uh, increasingly, I was talking to my father about, should I leave journalism, maybe work with him, or do something in Kurdistan to more directly serve my people? And we were having those discussions. And in fact, the, my last conversation with my father was exactly about that. 
so when once he was killed and and my brother was killed i just thought what am i waiting for you know i think this was my destiny and i should make the leap and i did and i became the representative in the uk and then 2015 here in washington and uh even though we've talked a lot about my father and brother's death um and how that happened i'm really much more inspired by their lives uh they were both very dynamic charismatic people and their life um and the lives of others who've been sacrificed in kurdistan is really what motivates me and what motivates so many people uh who strive for a better life for the kurdish people Well, I think on that note we've gone over but you've really given us a very good overview not only of the Kurdish people but the situation in Kurdistan and I want to thank you for caring on your father and brother's uh, tradition because uh, you at least in my opinion I didn't know either one of them but you have made them proud and I thank wish you. you continued success in Washington and um I hope that we get to meet in person sometime soon. Me too. I look forward to that. Thank you again so much uh for giving me this opportunity. Well, and thank you for sharing uh, sharing your time with us. And thanks to all the participants for staying, you know, past the the hour of our conversation. Um uh, we need another hour by Jan to keep continue this in fantastic dialogue. Thank you very much. Take okay. care. Bye.